Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for coming. I'd like to begin by saying a very special word of thanks to the co-sponsors of this afternoon's uh, lecture. Uh, we are uh, sponsored by the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions, together with the Program in Law and Public Affairs under its director, Kim Shepley, who is here, and I thank Kim very much, and the Pace Center under its director, Kiki Jamison, who could not be with us uh, this afternoon. I also uh, have the uh, pleasure of recognizing two members of the audience who really deserve uh, to be recognized, two visiting dignitaries whom we're delighted uh, to have here. First, may I uh, recognize the former president of Princeton University, Bob Goheen, who's here. And second, it's a very special honor uh, to welcome to this lecture and uh, to Princeton, Professor Carl Baudenbacher, who is the president of the Supreme Court of uh, the European Free Trade Association. President Baudenbacher. I can think of no better way to mark Constitution Day or to inaugurate the academic year for those of us who labor in the vineyards of constitutional law, than to welcome back to Princeton the true McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence, <laughs> Professor Walter Murphy. Professor Murphy's official title now is McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence Emeritus at Princeton. I assure you it was a bloodless coup. <laughs> Professor Murphy is, uh, as uh, the publicity that some of you saw uh, said, and this is not an exaggeration, one of the most distinguished constitutional scholars uh, produced by the 20th century, and he's now made it into the 21st. Uh, a decade after joining the Princeton faculty, he was named McCormick Professor, succeeding Woodrow Wilson, Edward S. Corwin, and Alpheus T. Mason in what was, until its most recent incumbent took over, one of the nation's most prestigious chairs. Professor Murphy is the recipient of numerous honors, including the Lifetime Achievement Award for the Ameri from the American Political Science Association in the Law and the Courts section, and the Chicago Foundation for Literature Award in 1980 for that other hat that he wore in his years at Princeton, that of a novelist, a writer of political and religious fiction. Professor Murphy is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a senior fellow of the Italian Academy for Advanced Study in America. He is the author of Wiretapping on Trial, which he wrote many years ago and is, again, a very highly relevant work. Elements of Judicial Strategy, still used by me and other professors of constitutional law in our courses. Uh, Congress and the Court, as well as his fictional writings, The Vicar of Christ, Upon This Rock, and The Roman Enigma. Professor Murphy served our country in the Korean War as an officer in the Marine Corps, earning the Purple Heart, the Distinguished Service Cross, three battle stars, and a presidential unit uh, citation. He earned his PhD at the University of Chicago. He was my mentor, I'm very proud to say, when I arrived as an assistant professor. I had the very great pleasure of teaching under him. He insists that I say with him that isn't really true in the great course in constitutional interpretation, which he took over from Professor Mason and taught with great distinction over many years. Generations of students, including some students sitting today on the Supreme Court, also count Professor Murphy as their mentor. And it's just so wonderful to have him back and to give you Professor Walter Murphy. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, as usual, <clears throat> sorry, Robbie is more generous than, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> more generous than truthful. The real McCormick <laughs> professor of jurisprudence was Alpheus Thomas Mason. Uh, and this lecture also comes under the aegis of, of, of that endowed lecture series. And I must say uh, about Alf, that the timing is excellent. It's the 18th, what is today? The 18th or the 19th? Today's the 19th, 19th. one day late. One day late, his birthday was the 18th of September. And Alf always held it against his parents 
that he wasn't born on the 17th of this September, which was Constitution Day. His mother allegedly said it was her, his fault that she was ready. Uh, in any event, uh, let me start off by saying that each year, Alpheus Mason would open his course on constitutional interpretation with the statement, there never was a more exciting time to study the Constitution than today. He was correct then, and he would be correct now. We are in the midst of a constitutional crisis of enormous proportions. By the way, I'm going to read much of this. Robbie said he had never, ever seen me read a lecture before. He's right. I never did. Uh, I always thought that was God's work to compose the lecture. I just went in and opened my mouth. Uh, I think God sometimes disavowed what came out, but uh, <coughs> in that way, I didn't have to take responsibility. In any event, I want to be very careful what I say because I do not wish to bush bash, but I do see that we are in the midst of a very severe crisis. Let me start by saying global terrorism poses a clear and present danger to the security of most nations in the West and some nations in other parts of the world. But the cause of the current constitutional crisis of the United States is twofold. First is the current administration's bald assertion until two weeks ago that the Constitution gives the president sole and plenary authority to deal with foreign affairs. The second cause of this crisis is congressional passivity. Most legislators of both parties have been rolling over and playing dead. Whatever the merits of individual policies in the war against terror, any claim to unchecked power strikes at the heart of constitutional democracy and the dust of the Constitution of the United States. We've endured imperial presidencies, uh, imperial judges, imperial judici imperialistic judiciaries, and even once an imperialistic Congress. But except for the brief period of Andrew Johnson's administration, earlier claims were neither so sweeping, nor did they promise to be so long lived. Uh, further, uh, Congress, neither Congress nor the judiciary is monolithic. Uh, Historically, at least, American legislators have been very individualistic. Uh, I think FDR said that leading Congress was like herding cats. Uh, the, uh, and judges are very vulnerable to counterattacks. An additional and seriously complicating factor in the war against terror is that it promises to last not for years, perhaps not even for decades, but for a century at least. If the President's assertion of unchecked and total power to interpret his own authority to wage undeclared war both at home and abroad uh, succeeds, it could very well destroy the heritage he claims to be protecting, a tragically ironic legacy for a President who calls himself a conservative. My argument to support my claims will proceed slowly, wandering. As those of you who know me know that I am incapable of going from point A straight to point B, I always have to have A1, A2, B1, and so on. Uh, I do, however, promise at the conclusion to leave time for challenges, which means I will not speak forever, though it may seem that long. Uh, my former colleague, uh, Marion J. Levy, Jr., used to say that people who can't define their terms don't know what they're talking about. So let me offer several definitions. First is politics. Uh, many, perhaps most, people in this country uh, equate politics with partisanship, uh, typically adding such adjectives as petty. The word, however, need not be so uh, pejoratively defined. Aristotle claimed that politics was truly the master art, it described efforts to achieve the constitutional order that best enhances the nobility of each citizen's character. By that definition, constitutional creation, constitutional maintenance, constitutional adaptation, and thus constitutional interpretation are no less political in nature than any other decisions made by legislative or judicial officials or executive officials or by private individuals when we act as citizens. To an important extent, each of us in that capacity is concerned with determining the nation's goals and the means uh, that 
uh, we judge to be proper to achieve those goals. Concern, that is, with allocating costs and benefits, rights and duties. Uh, Felix Frankfurter once said, uh, Alf, by the way, hated Felix Frankfurter. I shouldn't quote him in a lecture. But uh, he did say that Felix had a marvelous way with words. Uh, but Felix Frankfurter claimed that constitutional interpretation is, quote, applied politics. And he was exactly on target. Many clauses of the constitutional text are general in nature. We speak of due process of law, equal protection of the laws, the general welfare, uh, justice, just compensation. Uh, to interpret those clauses, to apply them to uh, specific problems, we need linguistic skills, syllogistic skills, historical knowledge, uh, and so forth. But also very important are experience, reason, moral sensitivity, and prudential judgment about how much we find desirable is also attainable. I also use the term constitutional democracy. By that I mean a political system that tries to blend the democratic ideal of government by the people with the notion of limited government, that there are some things that government cannot do no matter how many people want those things done. That government must always respect the basic rights of individuals to freedom and dignity. The people rule through their elected officials, but the authority of the people and those officials is a limited. We have such a political system. It's fragile, delicate, and it doesn't always function well. But it is a system that we took an oath to defend and support. Uh, to limit the power, the power of officials and the people who voted for them, we have a Bill of Rights and judicial review. Judicial review. But equally important, or even more important, political power in this country is divided at least so the Constitution would lead us to believe. Fractured might be more accurate between states and nation, between House and Senate, between President and Congress, between courts, and it sometimes seems everybody else. Uh, we have less a system of separation of powers because surely the powers overlap. Uh, then we have a system of separate institutions competing for shared powers. We have, as James Madison, Stanley Kelly, who taught him both as an undergraduate and a graduate student, said he was the best student he ever had. So I, I, I trust Stanley's judgment. Uh, James Madison said in Federalist 51, we have pitted power against power and ambition against ambition. Uh, actually, I've often read, but I have never seen a good source for it, uh, a comment supposedly voiced by one of the framers. If public officials are at each other's throats, they will not be at ours. I don't know if anyone ever said that, but it certainly uh, catches much of the flavor of uh, the American Constitution. All right, well, what do we mean by the Constitution? Uh, many decades ago, when Thomas Reed Powell used to teach constitutional law at the Harvard Law School, that was before Robbie's time, uh, he would come in with the copy of the Constitution say to his students, do not read this document. It will only confuse you. <laughs> what matters is not what the document says. What matters is what the Supreme Court says it says. Uh, I used to quote that in the olden days when I was teaching constitutional interpretation. And I would add that I was sure that Powell was right. Students at Harvard probably could not understand this document. <laughs> but I was, I was equally sure that students, excuse me, students at Princeton could, and that they ought to read it and reread it. They liked that a lot. Uh, still, Powell had a valid point. Uh, even the Supreme Court's great literist, Hugh, literalist, Hugo Lafayette Black read the Ninth Amendment out of the Constitution, and he read into the Constitution a version of democratic theory that demanded one person, one vote. Uh, there are other people who would include in the Constitution what they claim to be the intent or understanding of the founding generation. Others have other candidates. For example, such products of, of custom and usage as executive privilege and uh, senatorial courtesy. Furthermore, most interpreters believe that some previous interpretations have become part of the text. 
the beginning student in constitutional interpretation who is compelled to read opinions of the Supreme Court in the raw. Well, what I mean is that the opinions in the raw, not the student, at least when I was here, students were never compelled to read the Constitution when they were in the raw. But when they read the Supreme Court's opinions in the raw, they are always struck by the frequency of exquisitely nuanced arguments about what the court meant at earlier times and the paucity of arguments about what the tax means. Uh, more basically, or most basically, most interpreters read the constitutional document in the context of certain overarching normative principles of politics. Again, Alpheus Mason used to teach constitutional interpretation as applied political philosophy, arguments about basic normative ideas of politics. It was a wise decision, and I think it instructed many students. Uh, rather than offer a litany of candidates for inclusion, in the constitutional canon, let me simply list my own candidates, which I'd be delighted to defend during the discussion. And if I keep saying I'll defend it during the discussion, we may get out of here tomorrow night. But uh, first and most obvious is the text, though I fully realize that like language itself, parts of the text may change their meaning over time. Uh, at least the specific meanings may change, so the general concepts uh, probably do not. Uh, I would also add some other documents, at least parts of them. Uh, most obviously, the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by the creator of certain inalienable rights. This nation and its constitution were founded on that moral principle, or those moral principles. When we betray them, and alas, we have on occasion, we betray uh, our country, but we also implicitly deny our own rights to equality and freedom. In addition, I would include in Link the, the phrase in Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in which he spoke of government of, by, and for the people, an inclusion that points to the Constitution's having fostered a society that has become much more democratic than it was in 1787. Similarly, I would include Franklin D. Roosevelt's Four Freedoms, uh, they spell out a commitment to a political system designed not merely to promote the general, or to designed to promote the general welfare, not merely by stopping government from doing some things, but to uh, empower government to commit certain acts that would positively help citizen, each citizen pursue a life free from fear and want. Uh, these documents fit a long, though not unbroken, tradition of including in the American constitutional order normative principles of constitutional and democratic government, constitutionalist, I should say, that is popular but limited government based on respect for individual dignity and freedom. Uh, in sum, I would follow Aristotle's view uh, that any authoritative constitution uh, is really a way of life. It's a political culture, or it represents a political culture, tries to form a political culture. That is, it tries to include the norms and practices that most of society should consider binding both on public officials and themselves as citizens. In essence, when we interpret a constitution, we are interpreting a culture. It's a dangerous concept, and I understand the danger. Uh, it's open to the uh, charge that it's amorphous, vague, of little use, or perhaps of so many uses that it's of really no use. Uh, but I think that to view the Constitution merely as a ta text, no more uh, 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 a text that uh, confers, divides, and limits power is simply foolish. Woodrow Wilson referred to this sneeringly as how wrong it was to look on the Constitution as, quote, a mere lawyer's document. He himself was a lawyer, so he could get away with that. Not being a lawyer, I can't say it. I can only quote him. Uh, I think that one of the problems immediately becomes when you say this is a document that limits, grants, limits, and uh, what did I say, confers, divides, and limits power. You've immersed yourself in, into a normative theory of politics. You, how can you define power? How can you define, distinguish it from authority? How can you allocate it? Uh, how can you limit it without having some normative political ideas that 
underpin your, your, your uh, basic efforts to explain. I think taken seriously, an oath of allegiance to the Constitution demands much more than looking at it simply as a document. Now let me talk about constitutional change. My argument hasn't lost its way. Uh, the audience may have lost my way, but let me uh, explain that I'm just moving to another part of the forest uh, and talk about change. Belief in the inevitability of change is at least as old as Heraclitus. Uh, and change is especially evident in political affairs. To some extent, political systems resemble the Red Queen in, uh, through the looking glass. They must keep moving in order to stand still. Uh, more than two centuries ago, Edmund Burke, not widely known as a radical, uh, warned that a nation without the means of its own reform uh, is without the means of its own preservation. Thus, we should neither expect nor want our constitutional system to be static. And one of the great innovations of the Philadelphia Convention, which we take as so normal that we don't realize what a huge innovation it was, is the inclusion of Article 5 in the Constitution, which provides an orderly means of changing the text. That was new to the world. Uh, but as important as formal changes are, uh, and formal amendments. Uh, we look on the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments as especially standing out. Interpretation and usage have been much more frequent uh, means of constitutional change. Okay, now, let me move to the current constitutional crisis. I've defined terms. I have explained that I do believe in constitutional change as inevitable. And if I accept constitutional change is inevitable, how can I, uh, and understand it can be done without formal amendments, how can I then be so harshly critical of George Bush's assertions of plenary constitutional authority? First, let me state the obvious. To say that one believes that change is inevitable doesn't mean that one believes that any particular change is either good or legitimate. Uh, that old curmudgeon and John Randolph, uh, John uh, Randolph of Roanoke used to delight in telling anyone who would listen, and an awful lot of people who wouldn't, that change is not progress. I've grown more, sympath more sympathetic with Randolph as I've grown older, because fewer and fewer people listen to me, so I understand why he would keep repeating this. Uh, we may hope that evolving standards of decency indicate real improvement. Not necessarily true. Political evolution sometimes means regression. As any German who lived through both the Weimar Republic and the Third Reich would have painfully attested. The kinds of constitutional change that are legitimate are those that uh, reinforce our democratic and constitutionalist tradition. With good reason, we've been optimistic about constitutional change. The general trajectory of changes in our Constitution, general, not, not all, but the general trajectory, has been to more broadly define the people, to increase governmental uh, responsiveness to the people, and to increase protections for individual freedom and dignity. In sharp contrast, as I will point out, the general trajectory of this administration's efforts to change the Constitution has been to loosen governmental responsibility and constrict individual liberty. Uh, the continued existence of the American constitutional order has depended heavily on a sharing of powers, a sharing that produces competition so that no one person or branch of government has a monopoly of power. Madison called it, quote, the sacred maxim of free government, that power should be dispersed. As he explained in Federalist Number 44, and here again, Alf had the Federalist Papers, Alpheus Mason had the Federalist Papers memorized. He never had to look at his notes to see what. And sometimes he, when I was precepting for him, he would embarrass me by saying, Professor Murphy, was it Federalist 48 or 49 that Madison said? And would come a long quote. I don't know. And he'd shake his head as if, oh, what this younger generation is coming to. <laughs> well, what Madison said in Federalist 47, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, 
executive, and judiciary in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. This accumulation is precisely what Bush rightfully claims is his. Let me make a few specific points. According to one count, between January 2001 and June 2006, Bush issued more than 500 so-called signing statements saying that he judged certain portions of legislation passed by Congress, both houses of Congress, to be unconstitutional. The scope of those bills was wide. Uh, but let me just talk about at least one later. Uh, in a related uh, fashion, he has, we found out, he has not announced, we have found out through leaks that he has decided through the Office of Legal Counsel that many provisions of other pieces of legislation are unconstitutional. We don't know quite what those are. We do know one in the act I'll speak of in a moment, but we're not sure what the others because there has been no public announcement of these. Thus, we cannot hold the government responsible. Uh, but on the signing statements, uh, no one denies that the president has, an, has authority to interpret the Constitution. But the constitutional text itself, itself, itself gives him a means to do so. He can refuse to sign a bill, return it to both houses of Congress with his objections. And according, at least according to the text, if they repass it by two-thirds vote, it becomes law without his signature. He has not done that in these 500 instances. He has simply said, all right, you've passed it. I'm not going to enforce it. Uh, thus depriving Congress of its constitutionally delegated, specifically constitutionally delegated authority to override his veto. Uh, that certainly is a threat to the uh, constitutional system. What he has, he has justified this action by claiming that he and he alone has authority to direct the foreign policy of the United States. Uh, that he does not share this authority with Congress and certainly not with the courts. Uh, that is simply palpably false. The constitutional text does make the president the leader in foreign policy. He can, uh, he's commander in chief of the armed forces. He can make treaties with the advice and consent of the Senate. Uh, he can send and receive ambassadors and nominate again with the consent of the Senate, most important executive officials. That same constitutional text, however, also allocates to Congress a share of control over foreign as well as domestic affairs. Only Congress, subject to a presidential veto, has authority to appropriate money, appropriate money to run any branch of the federal government or to finance any program of the federal government. No money, the constitutional text says, may be dispersed from the Treasury except as provided by statute. Uh, in addition, at least Article I of the constitutional text says, Congress can declare war, raise and support armies, provide and maintain a navy, as well as make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, which is now partially folded into the National Guard, uh, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States. The so-called sweeping clause is also relevant. Congress has authority to, quote, make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers, and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or any department or officer thereof. It says any department or officer thereof. It does not say any department or officer except the president and the executive department. Uh, that's pretty good as a sweeping grant of power. Uh, the president, by the way, has also, when asked by congressional committees to provide uh, information so that they can oversee the spending of federal money and the carrying out of federal legislation. The president has on many occasions said, no, I will not do that. Uh, 
This is my concern and not that of the Congress. Uh, so far, as I say, most congressmen have senators, representatives have been rolling over. Uh, so, well, we don't get it. Uh, Congress has enough trouble legislating when it has information. Uh, without information, of course, it cannot legislate. Well, let me take one example so that I really don't speak forever uh, and proceed from there. And I'll use wiretapping, maybe for obvious reasons. Uh, uh, in which the administration is simultaneously vi violating both the express words of the constitutional text and asserting total executive dominance. The Fourth Amendment expressly provides that searches require a warrant and that warrants require a probable cause, require a probable cause, and uh, since only judges can issue warrants, you must have a judicial proceeding. In an act called FISA, F-I-S-A, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, Congress uh, provided a means here. Remember, it was a statute enacted after Richard Nixon was using warrantless wiretaps. And it was, the statute was designed to make sure that no president would do that again. Uh, Congress established a special three-judge court. Uh, and it meets secretly so that government secrets may be kept secret. And the government then presents its case for a warrant to these three judges. They hear the evidence and they issue the warrant or not. I saw some statistics and I think, I, I, I forgot to write them down, but roughly 6,000 times since the act has been in force, uh, the executive department has come before uh, the court and asked for a warrant. I think they got it in 5,900 and some. I mean, so it's, it's not exactly a, uh, a rigorous uh, vetting. Uh, furthermore, the FISA states that in an emergency, the government may wiretap without a warrant, providing it seeks one within 72 hours. That's three days. Uh, now, despite these comically easy uh, conditions. Bush has said that he, and only he, can determine whether a wiretap is constitutional. He is bound neither by an act of Congress, nor by the plain words of the constitutional text. And most assuredly, he has no obligation to seek the approval of a judge or judges. In this fashion, uh, the administration is violating the words of the text, but also what Madison called Again, the sacred tenant of free government, the core of constitutionalism. Furthermore, uh, by, gee, I wish I could read my writing, uh, uh, by claiming that it was a crime for the New York, by refusing to give information to Congress about what he has been doing, and by claiming that it was a crime for the New York Times to reveal that his wiretapping policy was follow following neither the constitutional text nor the relevant act of Congress. By claiming it was a crime, the chief magistrate of the United States is claiming you're committing a crime. I mean, there's the man in charge of the arm of government that prosecutes. Uh, I think that is a kind of censorship that would deny citizens the information that we need to judge the presidency. It attacks democratic uh, accountability. The president, I think, is also in his rhetoric trying to stifle debate by asserting that if we withdraw from Iraq, we'll be fighting terrorists in American streets. You know, I, I, I guess I'm misinformed, but I always thought that the World Trade Center was in the streets of New York. But, you know, I grew up in South Carolina, so you can't expect me to know much. Uh, the same time, the vice president, a man who took five draft deferments so he wouldn't have to fight in his war, is questioning not merely the wisdom, but the patriotism of those who question the war in Iraq. These people are echoing Attorney General John Ashcroft's statement after 9-11, that people who were concerned about the Bill of Rights were aiding terrorists. On the fifth anniversary of 9-11, just a week ago, Bush called for national unity in the war against terrorism. I know of no American who is opposed to a war against terrorism. We're divided on very different issues. One is the war, war in Iraq. 
Before we invaded that country, Al-Qaeda did not and could not exist there, as Bush himself has just conceded. Saddam Hussein saw himself as the sole ruler and did not tolerate uh, any organization that might challenge his power. It is also not irrelevant to note that Iraq, despite the administration's claims, did not have, then, did not have weapons of mass destruction. I was uh, hiking up in the mountains outside of Albuquerque with an old CIA man the day that Baghdad fell. I said, Brady, I'll bet your successes are now scurrying around uh, looking for weapons of mass destruction. He said, no, what I understand from some of them and their relations to this administration, they're scurrying around burying weapons of mass destruction so somebody else can find them. Well, nobody else found them. Uh, but I think our argument in opposing the war in Iraq is that that war has helped the cause of, of, uh, of terrorism. It has opened Iraq to terrorist organizations like al-Qaeda. It has triggered anger in much of the Islamic world and has alienated most of Europe. Uh, that's one divisive issue. The war in Iraq has nothing to do with a war in terror, or against terrorism, except negatively. Uh, another divisive issue is this war against the Constitution. The blueprint for this phase of the presidency was not drafted by James Madison, but by Carl Schmitt, an academic apologist for Nazism. Again, I'm not Bush bashing. I would not equate Bush's errors, dangerous as they are, to the unspeakable evils of Adolf Hitler. But it is instructive to compare Carl Schmitt's justification of the Nazis' claim to total governmental power with that of, of Bush. Schmitt began as a critic. He was a very uh, renowned philosopher, jurisprudent, legal philosopher in, in, in Germany. Uh, recently died in this, I think it was about 97, 98. He died in the late 90s, I believe, 1990s. Or 1980s, I beg your pardon. Uh, Schmidt was a critic of the weak government of the Weimar Republic. And with justification, it was a weak government. And he advocated a stronger presidency. Then he began to lean toward a dictatorship. He said a dictator would be the guardian of the Constitution and the nation. It would be he and he alone who would determine what was necessary and legitimate to protect that nation. Then after Hitler took power, Schmid uh, slid just a little bit down the slippery slope. Der Führer, he wrote, is not an agent of the state, but the highest judge of the, of the nation and its lawgiver. That doctrine was alien to Madison. It is contradictory totally, uh, it's totally contradictory of that sacred maxim of free government. But it does fit the current administration's description of the presidency. Not answerable to Congress, not answerable to the courts, not obliged to give the information that would allow us as citizens to pass judgment. Bush's defenders may point out, and correctly, that his grab for power is not unique in our history. We need go further back than Richard Nixon. And I'm not at all sure, uh, I'm critical of Bush, but I'm not at, as all, at all sure how Hillary Clinton or John McLean would have reacted had they been in the White House. This is not, I mean, Bush is the person who is claiming it, but it's not, I'm not speaking of Bush per se. The words, lead us not into temptation, form the most prudent prayer ever composed. When Jefferson was out of power uh, and was a critic of some of the things that were being done, uh, one of his uh, correspondents said, do you have no trust in man? And Jefferson wrote back what I think is something we ought to take in mind, keep in mind. He said, let us hear no more about trust in man, but bind him down by the chains of the Constitution. And George, we did, we have. And George Bush, I think, has struggled mightily to break those chains. I don't want to sound like Cassandra. Uh, my voice isn't right anyway. Uh, and I never learned Greek. But <clears throat> uh, you remember that she went through the streets of Troy warning the Trojans about the trickery of the Greeks uh, and is, was predicting disaster. And she's been an object of mockery ever since, Cassandra-like, et cetera, et cetera. But we've got to keep in mind she was right. 
The Greeks were tricky, and they did come in through the Trojan horse, and they did kill or enslave almost all Trojans. Uh, a very bad press indeed, you got. Uh, for us, there are some glimmers of hope. Many Republican officials facing re-election are quietly distancing, distancing themselves from Bush. And until yesterday's public opinion polls, uh, appro disapproval of his presidency seemed to be growing. And able to read electoral tea leaves, he, on September 6th, urged Congress to adopt legislation to establish tribunals to, cap uh, to try captured members of al-Qaeda. Qaeda. Remember, uh, up until the 6th of September, he had said publicly that he and he alone could establish the rules, the legislation, to establish the tribunals, to create the tribunals, and to give them the procedures that they would follow when they tried these people. In June, the Supreme Court, though only by a five before a vote, said no way, that only Congress could do that. So in September, Bush has urged that Congress do it, uh, that Congress pass legislation. This retreat may signal a long overdue dose of constitutional humility, or it may only be a clever electoral ta tactic, throwing just before the midterm elections responsibility on Congress uh, to lift him out of this particular quagmire. In closing, the two sweetest words an audience can hear, uh, I'll use a pair of quotations from a pair of wise judges. In 1967, confronting the crisis of the Cold War, Chief Justice Earl Warren wrote for the Supreme Court, National defense cannot be deemed an end in itself. Implicit in the term is the notion of defending those values and ideas which set this nation apart. 37 years later, facing our current emergency measures uh, and the claim by the administration that they could hold an American citizen without trial, without counsel, etc., as long as they wished, uh, just as John Paul Stevens wrote, if this nation is to remain true to the ideals symbolized by its flag, it must not wield the tools of tyrants, even to resist the forces of tyranny. When we face a serious threat to our nation's security, and we do, uh, there's no question about that. The basic question I think we should ask ourselves is, what does it profit citizens of a constitutional democracy to adopt the security of a dictatorship and become safe denizens of a police state. Sir. Well, thank you very much, Professor Murphy for burnishing the uh, Madison program's uh, reputation for right-wing speakers. <laughs> I, uh, I have a few questions myself, but I suspect our friends in the audience have a few questions. What we would like to do to make sure that the questions as well as Professor Murphy's answers are heard for our uh, videotape is uh, to have Sharif, who's one of our James Madison program junior fellows, bring the microphone round to you. Uh, if you. If you don't have the mic, the question won't be captured uh, on the tape. So uh, hands in the air. I'll call on people. Sharif will bring the mic. Uh, and uh, uh, before I recognize Professor Allen to ask the first uh, question, uh, I should say a word of thanks to Mr. John Hansel, who's a great benefactor of the program and who uh, sponsors the Alpheus T. Mason uh, Lectures in American Constitutional Law and Politics, The Quest for Freedom, in which this lecture, as Professor Murphy uh, pointed out, uh, is uh, uh, held. So, Professor uh, William Allen from Michigan State University and visiting the Madison program. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Walter, for clearly establishing the question for the afternoon. Uh, I want to pose a consideration for you. That's the are, are you picking it up? I, I'm not hearing it. Are you hearing it? Yes, I, I can hear you. At the heart of my work as a Madison a fellow this year is a project that aims to distinguish the fact of power from the personality of power. Mm -hmm. uh, by which what I intend to make clear is that there are two 
separate question of what government may do and who may do it. And I appreciate your emphasis that you're not Bush bashing, but the question is whether this president or any president may do it, what government may do. Yes. Taking that as a starting point, then, I want to return to the Constitutional Convention in order to try to, to get you to focus when we talk about the executive power as power rather than as personality. When the Randolph Plan was introduced to court, the objective was described relative to the different branches of government. And the executive branch was described in the following terms. Namely, it is to hold all that power which can be identified in the Confederation as executive power. Now, taking that as a stated purpose, which was repeated in the course of the deliberations and never withdrawn, what then is the sum of executive power that is conveyed in the Constitution in light of the current crisis, recognizing that its subject is some explicit uh, limitations such as the two-thirds requirement and the five of consent and the uh, veto authority override. So what is that sum of executive power relative to the question you were raising? Okay. Uh, first, let me back up just a bit and say that what the Constitution means is not dependent on what the 38, 55 people in uh, Philadelphia wanted. Uh, the Constitution begins, we the people of the United States. It does not begin, I, James Madison, and a group of my friends gathered in Philadelphia during this hot summer uh, thought the United States should have. So what the framers who include more than those people at Philadelphia. Certainly at least the, how many were in the, how many people were in the ratifying conventions? 1,200 roughly, somewhere around, around there. Uh, John Marshall incidentally was a member of Virginia's ratifying convention and he always considered himself a founder. Uh, that's why he paid no attention to, uh, a little attention to the Federalist Papers because in private he said, I know as much as James Madison. I was one of the people who ratified. This is what he said he meant, this is what I meant, and so forth. Uh, so what was the sum of power? I don't know. I think there, there, there was a, uh, an, another gentleman who taught at Harvard Law School who summed it up best. He said, what they said, they said. What they didn't say, they left to us. And what they said is essentially in Article One: the powers that I gave. It is the power to execute. Now the powers executive powers under the Confederation were just about zilch, zero. I mean, that was one of the great, that there was no way of enforcing, or very few, of enforcing uh, anything that the Continental Congress ordered. And I think uh, one object that most people who had any had thought about it of the new Constitution was to provide a means, an executive, who could correct this horrible defect. Uh, so I think the, the executive power uh, changes. It changes from time to time. Uh, and uh, these listed powers in the document are sort of a, a skeleton on which uh, those powers hang. But what is also very clear is that there are shared powers, that the president can do very little on his own. Uh, just as Congress can do very little on its own, and the Supreme Court can do very little on its own. You have to have uh, at least two of the three getting together. And uh, my objection to Bush is not that he would have strong executive power. My, uh, my uh, questions about the wisdom of his policy would remain, perhaps, if he had gone to Congress and Congress gave him these authorities, and if they were tested in the courts, and the judges said that they are constitutional. Uh, but my basic objection here is that he hasn't done either of those. He has said, I have it. I have the authority. I determine. And that's, that's not uh, at least what the Constitution, either the document or American practice, except in, you know, we can all cite exceptions. But, uh, that's not it. And that's my constitutional objection. My political objection would be quite different. Okay. You, sir. The, the, the microphone. Do you feel that 
George, the President Washington, when he had the farewell address. I'm sorry, we can't. Is it not on, Sharif? Can you pick it up up in the uh, in the room? No. Well, say, say the question and I'll repeat it. When, when President Washington, in his farewell address, warned us not to get involved in foreign intrigues, was it was it really in the spirit of constitution of limited power? Uh, the, qu the question is, did President Washington, when he warned the country in his farewell address against uh, foreign entanglements, was he um, emphasizing some aspect of constitutionalism? L limited power. Limited uh, power. I suspect that if we could sit down and say yes uh, by figuring out uh, Washington's wisdom that he knew that you got involved in foreign wars, you're going to have crises, and uh, crises may uh, trigger extraordinary means which could eventually uh, run the, ruin the, the constitutional order. But I think this was just a piece of practical advice. Uh, it had no binding power. Uh, just. Be careful, boys. Uh. Yes, uh, Professor Brubaker. <coughs> well, tr let's, let's keep trying, at least, with the mic. Uh, okay. Otherwise, I'll just try to repeat the question. Does this help? Yeah, please. It does help? I don't think it's going to be anyway. Uh, try. <laughs> you mentioned that President Bush may not be engaged. I wondered if you could compare uh, his assertions Just, just turn it off. Let's, let's not bother with it. So I give up. Okay, first with Jefferson. Uh, I think Jefferson asserted uh, power to interpret the Constitution in a way that's consonant with the Constitution. I always get annoyed when I hear people, as I did, uh, can't think of the guy's name for CNN, who's their legal advisor, who said, Tuman, yes, uh, who is very good usually, but occasionally he says a statement, and I was exercising one day last week, and he said, well, whatever the constitutional controversy, the Supreme Court has the last word. Forgive my using a four-letter word, but that's crap. Uh, the Supreme Court usually has the final word because people are tired uh, of the argument uh, and let it go. But they didn't have the last word when Jefferson was president. They didn't have the last word when, when Jackson was president. They didn't have the last word when Lincoln was president. They didn't have the last word when FDR was president, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, constitutional interpretation is a group exercise. Uh, presidents interpret, Congress interprets, uh, the court interprets, judges interpret, and we interpret. Uh, I think the greatest piece of constitutional interpretation this country has ever had was that by Abraham Lincoln, this first inaugural address, when he was facing the secession of the southern states. And he said, I hold as a matter of eternal principle and of this constitution that this union is indissolvable. What do you say, indissoluble? I don't remember. Indissolvable, I think it was the word. Uh, again, Alf would have had this. Uh, I think that's the greatest single piece of constitutional interpretation that this country has ever had. And it was a president. He didn't say the Supreme Court has said and Congress. He said, I hold. And that, I think, is perfectly legitimate. Uh, Congress could have overridden it. They could have refused to uh, appropriate money for them uh, to calling out troops. They could have uh, uh, done all sorts of things, uh, mostly with the money power immediately, but eventually uh, in other ways too. Uh, but he didn't say, I hold, and by God, if Congress disagrees with me, too bad. Uh, he said, I hold, and then fought 
the war. Now, Teddy Roosevelt's stewardship theory, I think, is perfectly consistent with anything that, uh, that I have thought. I don't know whether anything I've said today, because I often don't listen when I'm speaking. Um, it, um, he said, the president can do anything that isn't forbidden. Well, that's not what Bush is saying. Bush is saying, I can do anything I think should be done. Uh, and that's radically different. Because, example, do you just go back to that wiretapping example? Congress says, if you're going to wiretap, you've got to do it this way. Bush says, I don't have to do it that way. I can do it how I want. Uh, that's quite different from Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt also said, remember, carry a big, talk softly, but carry a big stick. I mean, we've been talking loudly and uh, carrying a big stick. So I, don't, I hope that's a partial response. Uh, yes. Huh? I we're, we're, we've give, yeah, so we've given Best. up on the microphone. Does this work? Yeah. Oh, now it's suddenly working. Oh. Be, beware, Walter, a graduate of constitutional interpretation. Oh. The course. The, the, uh, Alpheus Mason always referred to that as the course. Uh, there, there were 30 yard department court, course, no, the 28, as Stan would correct me in saying at the time, but Alpha always said, well, in the course. <laughs> Sir. Thank you, for pr Professor Murphy. Uh, uh, thanks, Pro Pro Professor Murphy, for uh, coming to speak. I took uh, constitutional interpretation uh, when I was a student here in 04. Uh, my question is, um, you talked about some of the predecessors uh, where the executive branch kind of wins out. I, I often think of the balance of powers in these conflict times, a game of rock, paper, scissors, shoot, and who actually wins out. And I, I question, you know, what ends up uh, determining the winner. Um, and you talk about the predecessors, and I think of Andrew Jackson's statement. You know, you, you mentioned Jackson's uh, presidency uh, in Cherokee versus Georgia, where he, he said, uh, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. Can I uh, interrupt and say one thing? Sure. Uh, most historians have concluded he didn't say that. Uh, I was thinking more of his veto of the bank bill, uh, where, remember, Marshall had held in McCulloch versus Maryland that it was constitutional to hold to federal government to establish a bank. Jackson said, I don't think it was constitutional. I think the court was wrong, and I took an oath to support the Constitution. I'm not going to sign the bill. I vetoed it. But he vetoed it, and Congress could then repass it. But that's what I was thinking of, that he didn't consider himself finally bound. Nor did Lincoln. But go ahead. I'm sorry. So, so my question is, what do you think um, perhaps could have been changed in the uh, writing of the Constitution that would allow for what you view as a more fair um, uh, result? I, I, I've, I, I've often thought about revising a Constitution. I've got a new and people usually chant, thank God, after my next sentence. My last book, uh, final book, is coming out. And uh, I have a long discussion of this kind of thing. I don't know, and I also once ran a seminar here uh, asking students to rewrite part or all the constitutional text. I don't know that it needs to be changed very much. I mean, picky here, picky there. But it isn't the text. I think the text grants sufficient power to Congress, to the President, uh, uh, and, to, uh, and to judges. The problem is when one branch of government, and sometimes it's been the President, sometimes it's been the Supreme Court, once with Andrew Johnson certainly it was, it was Congress, you may think of some other instances, but that's certainly the one that stands out, has decided that it's ours, baby, it ain't yours. Uh, and that's been the problem. Uh, once we got the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments in, uh, one can argue we got a new constitution, but at least a new constitutional text. But I, I don't see any crying need. I mean, I was not much in favor or opposed. Uh, I, I like the idea of the Equal Rights Amendment for women, but I didn't think we needed it. I thought we had the Equal Protection Clause. No state should deprive any person the jurisdiction of equal protection of the law, as long as women were persons. Uh, that covered it. And I think the same thing is true for gays. No person deprived of equal protection of the law. I mean, that's it. 
uh, that's what you need. Uh, you don't need to spell out every case. I mean, there are constitutional, I was an advisor when unofficial through a government agency when the Russians were drafting their constitutional text. And my God, this thing went on for hundreds of pages of, of you know, taking care of it. And the Indian constitutional text uh, in the same size page, uh, same size print, that you would have 15 to 20 pages for the American constitutional text runs to more than 300 pages. Uh, take, what time you can break for tea? I mean, what? <laughs> Nobody can understand it. Nobody. Um, if you think American constitutional interpretation is difficult, you ought to try Indian constitutional interpretation. Uh, the more documents they had, I mean, the longer the document. Uh, so my answer is simple. I wouldn't make any fundamental change. C can I? Uh, I'll, I'll answer some. I'll recognize some others in but a moment. But I can't help sharpening the question a little bit. All right, sharpen the question. Okay. But if the president believes mm -hmm. that the minority, the four justices who dissented in Hamdan, mm -hmm. are correct, mm -hmm. and that uh, the majority's opinion represents actually an incursion on his executive power and his mm -hmm. power to protect the nation, fulfilling his responsibilities under the Constitution, then for Lincolnian, Lincolnians, followers of Lincoln, like you and mm -hmm. me, when it comes to constitutional interpretation, wouldn't we have to conclude that the president would be within his rights and may indeed be obligated as a matter of constitutional interpretation not to treat Hamden as constituting a rule binding beyond the facts of the case at hand. Uh, yes, but he would also have to make a constitutional argument about Hamden being wrong. That's where uh, the, uh, if I remember, uh, that was back in June, and that's a long time, uh, that that's where he claimed he could provide, uh, in effect, the legislation, the rules to establish the tribunals, the rules that they would have to follow. That's a difficult argument to make, that a president can establish courts, that a president can establish the procedural rules they must follow, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I've never heard a convincing argument that way. The general but term- four, four dissenters thought they did. Uh, four dissenters did, and uh, I read their dissents, and I remain totally unconvinced. Although I will also concede that my former student, Sam Alito, uh, who replaced one of the majority, might well turn this around. Uh, Pro Professor Kateb, who keeps track of these things, is signaling it's actually three, so Alito's vote would turn it into four. Was it six? Oh, Robert, you're right, yeah, yeah. because he had voted the other way in a lower court. It, yeah, in the so DC. five four yeah. is technically wrong. <laughs> yeah, five three is technically right, yeah. but Roberts had voted in the same way as the three did when he was a lower court judge. But where your left is, you're not persuaded that there's an argument that should persuade the president. But if the president's persuaded, or, or as the a court. Lincolnian, yeah. you have to say he can defy the court's rule. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, he could defy the court's rule, uh, but he, as Lincoln did, he'd have to explain. But Lincoln huh? didn't defy the court's rule. He said he could, but he didn't. Yes, sir. Um, comment and sir. Uh, criticized the president for saying or indicating at least that the war against terror will last long and an indeterminate time. Isn't that, my comment is, it seems to me to be comparable to a statement made by President Kennedy more than 40 years ago, that we are engaged in a long twilight struggle, which indeed turned out to be the case. Yeah, may I, may I interrupt just to comment on your comment? Uh, I don't criticize Bush for saying the war on terror will last a long time. Indeed, I think he's right. I said I thought it would last for decades and possibly for a century. That's not a criticism of anyone except maybe Osama bin Laden. Uh, that my worry is that the extraordinary powers that Bush is claiming can last that long. Not that the war will last that long, but sorry, go ahead. Yes. Uh, in those statements, the president indicated that he was 
sign it, but he would not enforce it. Mm -hmm. And you said that this was clearly unconstitutional. No, I didn't. I thought that's what I heard you No, I said, I said that it violates the, it took away Congress's authority to override his veto. Uh, by signing it, I mean, they're, they're, well, it's unconstitutional in a, in a procedural sense. If he has that objection, then according to the constitutional text, he refuses to sign and sends it back. That gives Congress, a, to, allows Congress to exercise its authority. Uh, not that his not wanting to enforce it's unconstitutional, but the way he did it uh, is unconstitutional. That is, there is a procedure and he re provided for explicitly in the text and he refused to follow it. Right. But in practice it's unconstitutional yeah. in any case. Now if it's clearly unconstitutional, my question, why has it not been challenged? Well how can you challenge? Oh, well to get a, uh, a case, uh, well that, first of all it's the definition of a case. Somebody has to claim direct injury. The government has to be injuring you. If the president doesn't enforce it, he doesn't do anything. You well, can't. A member you of can't. Congress. Yeah. Why couldn't well, a member of Congress say I'm Because sometimes the court has said a member of Congress can have a suit, and sometimes it said it can't. Well, you appeal to the sometimes when it says it can't. Yeah. Uh, and that's been expanded. And, and contracted. Well, it's been also contracted. I mean, it's an elastic doctrine. What it really means is the court will take what cases it, want, it wants and won't take what cases it doesn't want. Uh, but how can you have, uh, you cannot, well, th there is a great Supreme Court case in this, Mississippi versus Johnson, right after the Civil War, when the uh, state of Mississippi tried to get the Supreme Court to issue a subpoena against the president forbidding him to enforce acts of Congress. And the court said, how can we do that? Uh, how can we stop the president from doing something? Once he's done it, we can uh, judge whether it was right or wrong. Uh, how can you make a president enforce a statute uh, that we don't have in the federal system, the so-called writ of mandamus, which is the, you know, if a state sheriff or county sheriff doesn't collect taxes, and required to. You can go to a state court and get a mandamus which says you must. It's an order. The federal uh, Congress abolished when 19, All Writs Act of 43, was it? Somewhere around there. Abolished the writ of mandamus in federal courts. You can't go to a federal court and get a writ of mandamus. Uh, I don't know how you would do it. Maybe, well, Robbie's a clever lawyer. Uh, Maybe he could figure it out. It seems to me that uh, if, if there's plausibility to your case, a con member of Congress who believes that his rights, specifically as a member of Congress, uh, to uh, participate uh, in, the ve in the overriding of a veto would give him sufficient standing. I mean, if people really think the argument you're making is plausible, they ought to take it to the Supreme Court and give him a shot. Well, I, I, I wish they would try. Uh, but that's when my, part of my argument was there's a second uh, side to the crisis. Most members of, Cong of the House and Senate are rolling over and playing dead. Uh, they're not challenging the president. Suppose this were Harry Truman. Can you imagine the Republican Congress of that day saying, oh, well, Mr. Truman, we love you. Uh, uh, I can't. Uh, I have uh, violated the unwritten constitution of the Madison program by failing to open the question session well, by student. reserving time for students to ask questions. And I apologize for that. But we can correct this defect by taking a few minutes right now for student questions. So let's have student hands in the air. I, I saw yours and then yours. Yeah, you, you sir. If, is this working? Who knows? Okay. <laughs> Basically, this, my, my question is about your point on we the people having the final say. Yes. If President Bush were allowed, were allowed to run for a third term and he were elected, would that count as, would that be an answer of we the people interpreting the Constitution and accepting this as constitutional, or would he still have to answer to the Supreme Court? What a great question. It yeah, it is. Question. Yes. Uh, I think that the answer would be uh, 
he would not have, well, the Supreme Court might be dumb enough to get in the way, uh, the justices, but I don't think they would. Uh, I think that would solve the question as far as constitutional interpretation institutionally was, con was concerned. I don't think it would solve it insofar as you make the answer right. I mean, I still think the answer would be wrong, but I also think that that would end the controversy constitutionally. One, one of the I things, think wrongly, but done. One of the things I learned from the constitutional interpretation courses that Professor Murphy taught was that from time to time we have to think about the people as constitutional interpreters. Yeah. It's not just the branches of government, certainly not just the Supreme Court. And an argument is made by Professor Ackerman at Yale and others that at key moments, the people, by acting through the normal <coughs> procedures of democratic deliberation, uh, interpret the Constitution by either ratifying or rejecting acts by those yeah. who purport to interpret the Constitution in a particular way. Somebody a, I know made that point years before. Who Bruce. taught Ackerman, right, in the Constitutional <laughs> Interpretation course. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Good evening, Professor. Um, I'm a sophomore student here, just beginning the journey through Constitutional Interpretation this morning. Uh -huh. um, I, I just finished reading. God bless you. <laughs> Go forward with courage, right? Um, I just finished reading the Honden case last evening and pouring through the dissents, and I was particularly struck by Justice Thomas's dissent in the case. And the main issue which both the plurality and the dissenting justices take up is this issue of the jurisdiction of law of war military commissions mm -hmm. and whether or not conspiracy is actually a violation of the law of war. Now, Justice Thomas makes an interesting point, which I think you may want to address, in saying that the courts have traditionally deferred to the president to determine what exactly um, needs to be proper procedure in these courts, and that these courts are not exactly, um, did not exactly need to be governed by the traditional procedures adopted by laws of courts martial. I was just wondering what your opinion is on conspiracy uh, rising to the level as a violation of the law of war, and who exactly um, is in the position to determine the proper procedure of law of war commissions. Is it the President of the United States, or is he governed to follow the precedent set, to follow procedures set down by laws of courts martial? Uh, it's a, there is no authoritative answer, let me start there. And uh, on whether you can conspire to violate the law here, uh, I know a lot of lawyers claim you can't, but I, I think if you can violate a law, you can conspire with someone else to violate. I mean, I, I don't see a, I may see a technical legal problem, or I don't, I, I, I might if I thought about it, uh, but what I do, uh, what I don't see is any logical problem. So uh, the conspiracy that doesn't bother me, uh, Congress has historically set, or given the President discretion, the general rules for courts martial. I mean, it comes under this authority to, to discipline the armed forces. Uh, and in the American armed forces, the so-called UCMJ, uh, adopted in 1951, uh, has very elaborate procedures. It's set out nicely. The, uh, under the Geneva Convention, uh, there is no specific procedure set out. Uh, and I would think this would be Congress's job and Congress's authority. And they might delegate a great, de might delegate a great deal of that to the President. But uh, the problem with the case was the President says, I don't need anybody. I'll do it. It's only mine. And that's where my difficulty arises. Uh, I don't think, incidentally, that uh, the people who are uh, in Guantanamo and the other bases are entitled to all the protections of the Geneva Convention. Because remember, to have the protection of the Convention, you must do four things. You must carry arms openly. These people usually do not. You must wear a uniform, or if not a uniform, an identifying badge so that other people will know who you are. They don't. You must be commanded by an officer who is responsible for your conduct, who can be arrested, tried, etc. And fourth, you yourself must obey the, law, the Geneva Convention. 
And you know, they fail on at least three of the four. So, but the other question is, now they fail on three, how, what do you do with them? Uh, and that, I think, is a practical matter as well as a constitutional matter requires fairly thoughtful and elaborate legislation. More uh, student questions, and, and I am able to recognize female hands if they would. Ah, oh, there's one, yes, in the back. Given that power, I think, when it coalesces in an entity like the executive branch tends to perpetuate itself, what do you think can be done so that the way Bush has um, interpreted the powers of the executive branch doesn't become the de facto interpretation that his predecessors will uh, Or his successors. Uh, his successors, yeah, sorry. I don't, I, that's what I find most bothersome. Uh, if this crisis goes on for another 50 years or 100 years, as I think it's very likely to, uh, what kind of country will we have? That's what really bothers me. Uh, you know, we can survive a, uh, a Bush for, he's only got, what, 27 more months, 20, whatever it is, but not a lot, not, uh, not a lot of more time. We can survive Bush, but I worry. Suppose Hillary Clinton comes in. I, uh, I'm not a Hillary basher either, but I don't know that I would want Hillary with that. In fact, I know I wouldn't want Hillary with that. Uh, John McLean, a man for whom I have great respect as a uh, fellow uh, officer. I wouldn't want him to have it. Uh, some of my colleagues got mad with me when I was chairman of the department because they flunked the graduate student on his PhD exams. And they said, uh, had various reasons, but it turns out they hadn't followed the correct procedures. And I said, I'm sorry, you know, as chairman, I can't forward this to the dean of the graduate school, et cetera, as having failed. Well, why not? Uh, he couldn't meet the standards. Okay, but you had to give him whatever the chances were, and you didn't do it. Uh, you can't, that was arbitrary power. You may have, the substantively, you may have been right. I mean, maybe he didn't deserve to pass the PhD exams. But we don't know that. Uh, and that was bothering. And they, they were quite angry at me, uh, three of them. Uh, but I'm sorry. And, and that's the same thing here. Bush may be right about uh, a number of things. But there is a constitution that gives, makes him share that authority. And he says, I don't have to. And I, I, I really worry about that. Uh, Up there? We're really making Sharif work. <laughs> Hi, my name is Michael Short. I'm a senior. I've taken uh, both of Professor George's classes here. Um, and, and I want to ask a question that's a little bit more based on one of the assumptions that you made, particularly regarding the nature of the Constitution, uh, which it is that you're using uh, in this whole analysis. Um, you invoke a couple of speeches and, and documents that uh, are certainly proclaim high values that most of us would agree are uh, normative principles uh, of the operation of this country. They are also political speeches and even going back to the Declaration of Independence, a largely rhetorical document written by a, a certain number of people with a, a specific purpose. Um, if we're going to appeal to anything to change the nature of the Constitution, it certainly seems that we ought to appeal to things that aren't uh, taking place during the Civil War when we've got a, a very obvious split in the country or during a Depression or post-Depression era when the people might be particularly susceptible to rhetoric, but perhaps on something a bit more solidly related to the, to the, the people themselves. Um, I want to make the, the point that, that the, the specific point that I'd like to address, which is that when you said that if we simply use the Constitution document itself using black letter law, uh, we're ignoring the fact that we need to have a normative principle behind the system of government. I think it's possible to draw certain normative principles out of the document itself just by looking at the Constitution uh, and use those principles as those which represent the Constitution as opposed to having to find the ones in other speeches. And I think that the speeches, when they, when they are appealing, are so because the principles that they draw to light, you can also find in the Constitution itself. So. Well, uh, let me say two things. First, you say political speeches. This is a political document as you will ever find. Uh, every kind, as I said, you know, in Aristotle's definition, the one I follow, uh, 
saying that something is political when you're talking about constitutional interpretation is like complaining that uh, the uh, football game last night, and I fell asleep before it finished, so I don't know who won, uh, but it's no fair. They were playing football. Uh, that's what this is. It is politics. It is an effort to set our values and to have means to achieve those values. Now, I was being realistic when I said people use these documents, and I use these other documents, because uh, what I, I can't say learn, but intuited from talking to Supreme Court justices, uh, from talking to senators, from, I never talked to, well, I talked to one president, uh, but I can't claim that's, that's hardly a, a good sample, uh, but from reading their papers and so forth. What they have all done is to read out of this text the kinds of things that I mentioned. Uh, you can get, uh, I mean, the justices could read into this laissez-faire, that government cannot do anything except stand aside and let people, you know, dog eat dog economy. Others read this text and said, government must come in and protect. Uh, there is no way you can read this document without having some normative general ideas. Uh, and I would rather than what I prefer is rather than claiming that I get them out of here, to be honest and say, here's where I get them and I think they're congruent with this text. And that, that's my point. Maybe that's being too blunt and too honest. Uh, the best thing to do is what Supreme Court, well, what Hugo Black did. He read this document and said, oh, how can anyone not read this and see that it means one man, one vote, or one person, one vote? It's easy. <laughs> Uh, but Black just went ahead, and I don't think he was being deceptive. I think he was, well, except to himself. Over here. Uh, Incidentally, I, I, I had the best example of this with the Chief Justice of New Jersey, who was a, an old and dear friend. I invited him to Conninterp uh, after the New Jersey Supreme Court had uh, closed the public schools in New Jersey because of the unequal funding. Uh, and a student as bright as you asked him the question, Chief Justice, you said that the educational clause in the New Jersey constitutional text requires equal funding. Now I have the clause here and it says the state shall establish a, an efficient system of public education. And Dick Hughes, who was a, a great man, looked at him and said, and you think efficient doesn't mean equal? <laughs> uh, uh, that's the sort of thing that, I, I mean, as much as I love Dick, I, I object to that. And I think it's much healthier if we would come out and say, as I did, I would include X, Y, and Z, and defend it. And I think I can defend doing it. That, that's, that's my point. Not that I think this is esoteric, and I think everybody does it, and very few people will admit it. Yeah. Excuse me, sorry, but good question. Uh, in light of your view that uh, justices, I, I presume justices, should uh, use their normative philosophy in interpreting. Uh, no, not they should, they do. <laughs> OK. Uh, well, in light of that, would, would you advocate then for a system of election for the Supreme Court where uh, the will of the people, as, as they understand the normative philosophy of America, is represented in the composition of the court, and that way would we have a greater uh, chance at, at getting the constitutional system right? All right. That's a good question that's been asked, and uh, electing judges in this country has been considered. Actually, almost every state. How many states? Now? Many states do, and, and they were progressive states. era reforms yeah. in many cases yeah. to move to an elected judiciary. Uh, in New Jersey, judges are nominated by the, the governor, and confirmed by the Senate for seven years, and if the committee on which I sat for 13 years, which is the Committee on Judicial Conduct, had no black marks against them, they were reconfirmed by the Senate, and there was a gentle person's agreement that regardless of party, 
if a Republican if was governor and a Democrat came up for reappointment, the governor would send the name to the Senate, and if there are no black marks, the Senate would reconfirm. All right. I now live in New Mexico, where damn near everybody's elected. Uh, uh, I sometimes think the electors are elected. But the trouble with that, you know, there are many problems in the executive department, where the attorney general may be of one party and the governor of another. <laughs> and, you know, the attorney general, the governor wants to have a certain policy, the attorney general doesn't, so the result is you have no policy. But uh, with judges, judges are elected. <coughs> Elections in this country are expensive propositions. The judges have to go around hat in hand and ask people for money. And they claim they forget who gives them money when they get on the bench. Uh, I don't mean to be cynical, but I find that a bit hard to believe. Uh, I was in a trial last year, a civil suit, and the trial began and the other side's attorney walked in. The judge jumped from around the court and embraced him. And I looked at our lawyer, he says, well, you have to understand that this guy's brother is the one who financed her campaign to be a judge. Now, curiously enough, she made eight rulings in our case. Seven were in his favor, and one was in our favor, and it was actually, it seemed to be in our, it actually wasn't. We were sandbagging the other side, hoping that he would that she would rule in his favor and then we could prove that he was trying to submit a piece of perjured evidence into evidence. We had another witness who was going to come in and say that was, you know, that was sheer, that was, that document was perjured and that lawyer knew about it. And she was smart enough to see this and so she ruled in our favor that uh, uh, electing judges is a very dangerous position, can, uh, proposition. I had a good friend who was a uh, justice in a state supreme court. And he said, I gotta go out and raise a million dollars. And it really bothers me because the obvious people are the law, big law firms and they're gonna come argue before me. And what in the name of God am I gonna do if a guy's giving me $50,000 and he's arguing a case before me? Uh, over here, there's a, we're gonna now open the floor again more generally and y you had a question. I'm always concerned. As an attorney, I'm always concerned with where the remedies lie in some of the issues that, that you've raised. And it seems to be certainly on the signing statement, although Professor George takes a position that a member of Congress could raise the issue and have standing. My concern is about the detainees, where you indicate that those in Guantanamo have less than full constitutional rights. No, I, I don't claim that. What I claim is they don't have the full protection of the Geneva Conventions. Not that the, the problem that I have is how does one get jurisdiction to bring those cases before the court if, in fact, the president has decided that some of the detainees in some given locations under the full authority of the United States are not going to be disclosed? And does that constitute some form of unconstitutional conduct on the part of the president? And is there a remedy to it? I, I agree. You know, the, the old common law statement, there's no right without a remedy. Uh, alas, I mean, that may be true as a, an empirical statement. I don't think it's true as a moral statement. Yeah, uh, these people are in Guantanamo because I don't think that technically any federal district court had jurisdiction in Guantanamo. I may be wrong. Uh, you may remember when the so-called assassins of Lincoln were arrested, although it's now unclear that several of them had anything to do with it, they were brought to an island off the coast of Florida where no federal court had jurisdiction. So they couldn't have a writ of habeas corpus and it couldn't be determined that they were illegally held. My problem is the constitutional text, and here I sound like a real literalist, says no person shall be deprived of his right to life, liberty, and property. It doesn't say no citizen. It doesn't say no person entitled to the Geneva Convention. It says no person. Uh, and what kind of remedy can you have? The one, the most obvious one is the one we're not gonna get. It is that Congress passes a law and says that federal courts have jurisdiction in this area and provide a procedure for uh, a remedy. We're Walter, may I, uh, may I close us with a barbed question? That, a barbed uh, a question? A barbed question. 
that I can't resist asking oh, because right. our friend Stanley Kelly is here. Uh, if we're going to use the kind of language that you've used, which is harsh, in, uh, dis in depicting the threat that you perceive to civil liberties by President Bush's actions and the acquiescence of Congress, wouldn't we have to say that that threat is, we might even say paltry, by comparison with what President Franklin Roosevelt at the urging of Earl Warren and over the objections of J. Edgar Hoover did by, among other things, with the acquiescence of the Congress and in the turning Court. Japan and the Supreme Court in turning Japanese Americans. There's nothing close to the forced removal of thousands of people, their goods confiscated, uh, never returned in many cases, and taken off to camps in Oklahoma and places like that. In New and, Mexico. And, 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 well, God. Uh, now, I, I, Robbie, I think the worst blot in American history since slavery was the Japanese-American internment in World War II. Uh, I, Bill Douglas, as you may, well, you, you have no way of knowing it. Bill was an old friend. But uh, when I was young, he asked me to help him write his autobiography, not write, but to research his autobiography. And uh, I got to the Japanese-American cases. I was going through the papers of Frank Murphy and found that initially Douglas had dissented. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then he changed his vote. And I found out by going through the papers and talking to Black's law clerk uh, that Douglas, Black had come to Douglas, read his bitter dissent, and said, can we work some kind of compromise? So the two of them, three of them, sat down together one Saturday morning, and they reworked Black's opinion for the court and took away, took out a lot of the language. And I, thanks to Bob Goheen, I had met Bill Douglas and uh, Bob provided the money for me to go down and interview him and talk to him and, and, so, and so forth. Uh, and being young and brash, I said, uh, uh, how do you feel about that? And Douglas was sort of irascible and he looked at me and said, how do I feel about it? I said, yes. How do you? He says, I caved in. I said, well, how do you feel about it now? He says, I'm ashamed. Do you want to ask anything else? <laughs> I wasn't totally stupid. I said, no, sir. <laughs> uh, uh, so the answer to your question is, I, I think, again, since slavery, there's been no greater blot on American honor and constitutionalism than the, ja the internment of Japanese Americans. By Franklin Delano Roosevelt. By Franklin Delano Roosevelt. With the acquiescence of the Democratic Congress and the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court. <laughs> now, it's not <laughs> I don't care who does it. I mean, uh, uh, there was, when I took an oath of allegiance as a young officer, the general who administered the oath said, listen carefully. I swear to defend, defend and uphold the Constitution of the United States. You are not taking an oath to defend the President of the United States mm -hmm. or the Congress or any policy. You are taking an oath to defend the Constitution. Never forget that. And uh, I was too young. I was only 12, so I was even less uh, or even more dumb then. <laughs> but uh, I... I've always thought it was the most horrible thing we have done. It was done by Democrats. That doesn't make it right. I mean, this is done by Republicans. That doesn't make it right. And it wouldn't make it right if we were Hillary Clinton or Franklin Roosevelt or John McCain or anybody else. It's wrong. Well, before I ask you to join me in uh, thanking Professor Murphy for his wonderful lecture and this terrific exchange of uh, views, uh, and invite you to the uh, reception in honor of the true McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence. I just want to take a moment uh, for a commercial uh, advertisement. Uh, on Tuesday, October 3rd in the Friends Center at 4.30, we have another lecture on uh, constitutional matters by Matthew Frank of Radford University who's coming to speak on the Supreme Court and the inversion of the due process clauses and the subtitle is provocatively a judicial, from a judicial rule against arbitrary power to the power of arbitrary judicial rule. So that's at 4.30, October 4th, 
uh, in the Friend Center. Then on uh, November 6th, 7th, and 8th, uh, I'm delighted to announce that we will be having our Charles, annual Charles E. Test public seminars, and this year they're being given by the distinguished bioethicist and uh, former chairman of the President's Council on Bioethics, Dr. Leon Cass. So that's um, November 6th, 7th, and 8th uh, at uh, 4.30, again in Friend 104, the uh, Computer Science Center. And then on November 20th, I'm very, very pleased to announce that we will be having this year's annual Herbert W. Vaughn Lecture on America's Founding Principles, and the lecturer this year will be Professor James McPherson, Professor Emeritus here uh, at Princeton, the George Henry Davis Professor of History Emeritus, and he will be speaking, and this is very timely and in line with Professor Murphy's uh, remarks today, on Abraham Lincoln's invention of presidential war powers. There are many other Madison program events as well as uh, events from our uh, by our uh, sister uh, programs like the Law and Public Affairs Program and the Center for Human Values uh, and the uh, PACE Center. Uh, those are widely publicized. Most of them are open to the public and I hope that you'll um, uh, look for them and attend them. But I wanted in particular to call those three uh, to your attention. And I do now invite you to join me in thanking Professor Walter Murphy and joining us for a reception.